<laughs> and welcome back to Jeff Green and Gay Live here at Citizen Television, here with the Grand Mullah Senior Counsel, Ahmed Nasir Abdullahi. We're talking politics, we're talking Jubilee, we're talking judiciary, we're talking state of the nation. Grand Mullah, about two years ago, in your magazine, Nairobi Law Monthly, you actually predicted that William Ruto would face some headwinds down the line, didn't you? I, well, I didn't write the article, but I remember, I mean, there was a story to that effect, yes. You published it, Grand Mullah. You must know about it. No, no, I know about it. I'm not denying. Okay, so if it wasn't Ruto, which, who was the choice going forward, who do you think it would be? You know, I, I don't think anybody can predict that. I don't think even the president himself has any idea. I mean, you see, that nobody can decide for... You hear a lot of nonsense about guys saying there's something called system or there's deep state. I mean, those, th those guys don't elect the president or our politicians. Our president, our deputy, and our politicians are elected by the Kenyan voters when they go to the polls. And this election, like any other election, will be about numbers. Who has the numbers? Who has the means? Who has the resources? Who has the coalition that can win this election? That is what wins your election. So, I mean, the president may be against you. The president may be for you. That may be a small factor, but it's not the decisive factor. It is who has the votes, who has the numbers. Yeah, but someone once said, it's not those who vote that count. It's those who count the votes. No, that, that quote is uh, attributed to Vladimir Lenin when he was leading the Bolshevik Revolution. I mean, that guy has never participated in an election, so that's a fake quote. It's a fake quotation. <laughs> All right, let's switch gears, Grand Mullah. Let's talk about the courts. A lot of lawyers are pressuring for courts to reopen during this time of COVID-19. Today alone, 66 cases. We've crossed the 1,000 mark of positive cases. Is this the time to open up anytime soon? No, I think, frankly, the Chief Justice has shown complete failure of leadership. I mean, I mean, he, did, he wasn't a great manager in the first place, but uh, the way he managed the courts during this crisis just showed his ineptitude, ineptitude, in my view. I mean, he should have put a better way of handling this. I mean, courts play a very important role. Lawyers and the legal sector employ thousands of Kenyans, tens of thousands. I mean, lawyers, when you close the courts, I mean, lawyers can't pay fees. I mean, I mean, lawyers are not, we are not known for having great savings in the banks. I mean, lawyers make money, but they don't save a lot. So there's a lot of crisis. I mean, how do you pay your lawyers? How do you pay your other workers? I mean, there are about, you know, 80 to 100,000 Kenyans who work for lawyers. If you look at, you know, the clerks, the court clerks, the lawyers, all this. And then you just shut down the courts for all this time. Okay, I know they have mitigated in a way, you know, this uh, Zoom hearing and Skype hearing. But that's not, I mean, we need, a, we, need, we need a better way to address this system, and quickly, in my view. But how do we do that, uh, Grandmula, with social distancing? You know, Kenyans love to attend court sessions. How do you do the social distancing in a court setup? No, no, no. It's, it's very simple. I mean, you, uh, the public need not attend courts. You will tell them, don't come to court. But lawyers can come, and you give them, you know, a certain time frame when they should come, 1 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 11 o'clock, you know. And then the courts are very special. You have two lawyers and one judge, and you can listen. There's enough distance. I mean, it can be done. I mean, but you know, just shutting the courts and uh, throwing the keys away like the CJ has done is completely responsible. Yeah, but there's some critics who say, you know what? The lawyers are now broke because they're not going to court. That's why they're pressuring to go back to court because they need. <laughs> the, they're doing it. Of course. For commercial well, I mean, that is the truth. They, there's nothing wrong with lawyers being broke because the courts are closed. Of course, we are broke because the courts are closed. Okay, so go, I mean, look at the backlog of cases right now. How long is it going to take? For instance, if, let's say I had a hearing in March that's been cancelled. I don't know when that hearing is going to be. What happens to the backlog of cases like that one? Okay, you know, uh, I think, let me take you back a little bit. I mean, we had a huge problem in this country because the president has refused to swear, you know, the 41 judges. Uh, there was backlog because of that. The courts are understaffed because the president has refused, you know, to swear this judge. We already had that problem, but now this, uh, the COVID-19 has compounded the issues. Cases have been postponed. 
Okay, uh, give credit. There are some courts that are here. The Court of Appeal hears cases uh, in a fairly acceptable manner. I have done one or two cases myself. I'm doing some others uh, in the next uh, coming few days. But uh, the judiciary is at a breaking point because of you know this crisis and the refusal by the president to swear the 41 judges. And that is just unfortunate. Look, uh, Justice Jack Tenojuang retired earlier this year. The CJ will be retiring next year. Should he have gone sooner? Yes, uh, yes, yes, that's true. Yes, yes, there, there are two vacancies that will arise in the Supreme Court in this year, the Chief Justice and that one of Justice Ojuan. Yes. So look, what's going to happen next? I mean, it's going to throw things further into turmoil coming into an election year. No, I think, I mean, the JSC will uh, pick the, will, you know, the JSC will recruit for those two positions, and uh, I think uh, they will do the normal process, advertise, then uh, they will pick two guys or two ladies of their choice, and uh, that will be over. Is there friction between, the other day there was a headline of friction between selection of some senior councils to be brought on board, and then that, that was quickly rejected. What is the tension? No, no, no. You know, we, are, we have a bar called the Senior Council Bar. It's a very small bar. We, uh, we want to expand it so that we have more lawyers. Uh, today, I had the privilege of being uh, elected chairman of the, of the Senior Council uh, Bar. So I think we will recruit more lawyers to join the bar, and they are very good lawyers who will deserve that position. So I think that's something we will resolve uh, in the next uh, few weeks. There were some names that were proposed the other day and then quickly rejected. Why? No, not, reje <laughs> not rejected. I think my friend Donald went to court because uh, he was of the view that the process was, uh, the, 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 the proper process was not followed. The matter is in court. But I think it's, that's something that we can resolve uh, and we move forward so that uh, uh, we admit more lawyers uh, into the senior council bar. Which, and there are many lawyers, very good lawyers, you know, who deserve to be in the senior council bar. Mm. What would you like to see in the next Chief Justice, Graham Ola? You know, I mean, I mean, this position is very important, you know, both for the courts, for the country. We need a good Chief Justice. We don't want to... We need someone with a spine. That's very important. But also we need someone with integrity, someone with the right intellect, someone... Uh, I mean... I mean, unfortunately, the last four or five years, the Supreme Court of Kenya died, uh, as some of us feared completely died, you know, engulfed by corruption, engulfed by incompetence. I mean, I was, I mean, I was the architect of the first Supreme Court of Kenya when I was in the JC. And like many Kenyans, we had great vision. We had great hope. Um, but unfortunately, that court, you know, I mean, in the last five years, I mean, it has become the most useless court in the country. It has betrayed the hope of Kenya. It has uh, done nothing in terms of uh, developing the law. It has done nothing in terms of resolving the dispute that divides the country. It has done nothing in terms of standing for, for integrity and decency. So the next Chief Justice will, has, will have a huge job to do in terms of, even before he comes to clean the judiciary, I think the next Chief Justice's biggest task is to how to save the, the Supreme Court. And I think the best way to save the Supreme Court is it needs a complete overhaul. It needs a reconstitution. It needs... Uh, some entrenchment here and there, but that's for the next Chief Justice, whoever it is. Um, would the Grand Mullah be interested in a position such as that? I've said many times, and I think I will, I'm not interested in those things. I mean, the Supreme Court of Kenya, as it is today, is not a worth, it's not worth my time or worth the time of any decent person. It needs a lot. I mean, you have to start afresh, and you need to have a lot of energy, you need to have a lot of goodwill. Uh, it's not an easy task, but I'm not interested. But in the event... I, I want to be on Jeff once in a while, so... <laughs> <laughs> okay, in the event that there was another presidential election petition come 2022, you see the players, the chips have to be in place, the election of a chief justice and a Supreme Court justice. Yes, I think they will be there by then. I mean, uh, I don't know why, what the I don't know what the JC is waiting for. They can recruit the position for uh, left vacant by Juan, 
because that position is vacant, uh, they can start that process and fill it within two, three months. But I think the Chief Justice is something they will do within uh, the first half of next year. So by the time, you know, we go to elections in 2022, I think the court will be fully constituted. Uh, I've got two questions from Professor, your good friend, Professor Makao Motua. Are you ready? Absolutely. One, do you finally agree with him that Jubilee was a house built on sand? No, 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 no. I mean, Jubilee was built on sound funda foundation. You know, it was a party of the people for the people. It was a very popular party. It won two elections decisively. His candidate lost those two elections badly, he knows. And uh, I mean, Jubilee was built on sound principles and sound policies. That now it is, it is engulfed in this turmoil does not mean anything in terms of its foundation and history. His, this is second question was, and I'll say it in his accent, why are you unhappy with former Prime Minister working with Mr. Kinyara? <laughs> <laughs> I have no problem with that. I mean, uh, you see, I'm not the President Kenyatta. I'm not Raila. So why should, I, why should it bother me whether they work together or not? I mean, it's none of my business. I mean, it doesn't affect me in any way. But uh, they're working, in my view, as a lawyer, as a constitutional lawyer. They can work together politically. But, you know, these favors the president is bestowing on Raila, like he's a co-president, is not provided for in the Constitution. Actually, it's an express breach of Article 130, 131, and 129 of the Constitution, if you read it. And I'm sure Professor Macau has read it. He knows it. <laughs> okay. There's some people who say... But I think... Oh, go on. But I, but I think Macau, I mean, it is, it's the right time for him to give up hopes he has. I mean, he had hopes for too long that his candidate will win. And, uh, you know, we are going into the third decade. When will he give up? Or maybe he wants the chief justice job. I think there's a better chance of him getting chief justice than... <laughs> Let me not finish the sentence. <laughs> Grand Mula, there's some critics who say the reason you're so bitter with the Supreme Court is because you lost, frankly, you lost the presidential petition in 2017. What do you say? No, no, I argued, you know, I argued three cases in the Supreme Court. I won, I won two, I lost one, and uh, everybody knows why we lost that one. I mean, they just wanted to appease the gods, you know, not because our client uh, had a bad case. When you, when you, I mean, when, when you win with 1.5 million votes and you use, you know, forms that were forged, forms that were not part of the record, I mean, everybody knows history. I, th I think history will record very well how that decision was made. And that's not a decision the Supreme Court of Kenya is very, is very, is very, is very proud of. But I'm not bitter with that. I'm bitter with the court because of many other reasons. I mean, I have done cases where, uh, you know, judges in the court have taken money to decide cases. I mean, and everybody knows. Uh, I've done cases in the court where judges were compromised. I have a lot of evidence on, uh, on the courts. I have, I have cases where they give uh, parties even uh, fake judgment in advance. I, have, I mean, there's a lot of things on the Supreme Court. I mean, if I start it now, I, <laughs> it will take a lot of time for me to tell Kenyans what happens in that court. It's a, it's a shameful place, shameful. Hmm. Graham Muller, um, I was going to ask you this uh, before I was distracted by the Brookhouse case. Remember you, the, the current ongoing Brookhouse case? They said it was brought up by one of the parents, and, you know, Brookhouse is a bunch of rich kids, is it not? But who told you rich kids don't have rights? Point noted. Huh? <laughs> Point. <laughs> okay. It's, go on. Every go on. person in Kenya has rights. Whether you are rich, whether you are poor, whether you are white, whether you are black, whether you are this tribe. I mean, the, the right is the right provided for by the law. Hmm. All right. Earlier on, I was asking you about people like Francis Atwoli, David Morave, advising the president. W what, what is this about? 
No, you know, I mean, David is my friend. I have a lot of regard for him. I mean, if he advises the president, I have no problem. I mean, he has the right intellect. He has the right personality. He has the right, you know, he's a man of all. I like him a lot. He's my friend. But, you know, but let me ask you, what advice can Atwoli give to the president in my foot? <laughs> what can... Atwoli is barely literate. I don't think he's going to... What, what advice can he give to a president? Uh, I know he's one of your good... Uh, customers when it comes to your show. But what advice can you give to President? Uh, may, I may, maybe crack jokes. <laughs> Grand Mula, or let, throw telephones. <laughs> let, let, let's face it. A lot of what he has predicted has come to pass. Let's face that, Grand Mula. No, no, please don't insult the intelligence of Kenyans. Atwoli, Atwoli is a, I think he's the chairman of Kenya Horticultural something. Workers Association? <laughs> what has he done for workers? I mean, he has killed the trade unions. I mean, the trade union was a very important uh, player in Kenyan politics and Kenyan economy. Where has he, what has he done with the, with, with the Lepe Union? He left that, and then he's thrown, I mean, he's running around, you know, bedlin uh, rumors as advice, and uh, it's unfortunate, you know, that's, uh, that is the tragedy of Kenyans. I mean, a trade union, unionist, instead of helping the workers in this country, is fighting William Ruto every day, is fighting other politicians, is addressing prices. Why doesn't he perform his day job, mm. which is to better the lives of the, of the workers he represents? And you, you don't ask him that question when he comes to your show. Okay. Um, a very keen viewer is asking, is there going to be a referendum this year? I mean, I don't like predicting, but if it comes, we'll see. If it doesn't come, we'll see. I mean, the country is broke. You don't have even money to pay <laughs> basic <laughs> wages of Kenya. Why do you want to have a referendum? <laughs> and why do you know? Also, it doesn't make sense to change the law, especially when a president is leaving office. It doesn't show. It's not good faith, in my view. Yeah. Here's another question, Grand Mullah. What is your philosophy on right and wrong, good and bad? You seem to be such a good lawyer that you come across as neutral on good and bad. Common sense. What, I mean, I mean my, my sense of what's good and bad is what, you know, Jeff will find bad or good or what an ordinary Kenyan will find bad and good. Just common sense, you know. The average Kenyan, I'm an average Kenyan in terms of what's good, what's bad, what's right, what's wrong. Yeah, but common sense is not that common, huh? Uh, maybe in Kenya, but... <laughs> <laughs> Grand Mullah, you have criticised these daily briefings on COVID-19. You've criticised them. I mean, look, in the UK, the minister briefs the press every day. In the U.S., same thing. Why do you criticize uh, the daily briefings about COVID here? No, Jeff, like, like everybody, I watch the briefings in other countries. I, like, I, I, I mean, I, uh, you really you, you, you understand what they're communicating. But here, I think there's a Kenyan who made a very important point. He said, we don't need this briefing. Why don't they send an SMS telling us the number of guys who tested positive per day? Because that's the only thing they say. I mean... From day one to, day, to, to today, it's either 10 or 15 or 20. Nowadays, there are 40 or 50. But that's what they tell us. I mean, that's rubbish. I mean, that's, they can do that through an SMS. They don't have to appear on TV. And uh, I mean, look at, uh, we, we are now struggling with this uh, virus. How many days? About two, three, two and a half months. Yep, about. We have tested 40,000. I mean, it's a, it's a joke, really. It's a joke. I mean. I, I said this before and I repeat, in so far as this virus is concerned, we're in God's hand. I don't think the government is doing much. Uh, so you don't like the additional measures? No, no, no. The, the additional me actually, the additional measures make sense because they mitigate the issue. I mean, it's, you know, when you have this curfew, when you have this partial lockdown in certain parts of the country, I think that's a very helpful strategy. What I raise question is, you know, these senseless numbers, you know, unscientific numbers, where we are told, you know, five or ten people have tested positive, we don't know under what circumstance. We are not being told why they can't do testing in, with reasonable figures or numbers. I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, 
I think the I think uh, the the minister is very disappointing, very disappointing. You know, he seems to re reassure quite a few people. They seem to love him and, and his deputy, uh, the CAS, and uh, some people seem to enjoy that, that reassurance, Grand Mula. No, no. It, it, the first days, I mean, even me, I was very reassured. I liked it the first days, but, you know, when you repeat the same diet for six, for 60 days, the same thing, you tell me the same thing, that five people tested positive, there's nothing else. You, I mean, it gets boring. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Another viewer wants to know, is there going to be, or oh, what's the future of the BBI? You know, those, are, those are useless things I've said many times. You know, it's a waste of time, you know. Those are lullabies politicians play for Kenyans to soothe them, to make them forget the problems we are facing. It's completely unnecessary. I mean, it is a show game, uh, you know, played by the president and his uh, and uh, Honorable Raila. But it's, it's for them, you know, I mean, they have the cards, they do what they want. But when you look at, uh, you know, when you look at the problems facing this country, you know, the economic difficulties the common man faces, you know, the absence of the rule of law, you know, the, all these issues, then you won't tell us, you know, that my priority is BPI, I want to expand the legislature, I want to increase 150 MPs. I mean, what sense does that make, surely? I mean, it's bullcrap. Grand Mullah tweets are coming in thick and fast. Some questions, I'm going to go straight to them if you don't mind. Keegan Koech is asking, did the Grand Mullah just insinuate that the position of Senate Majority Leader doesn't exist in the Constitution? I did not insinuate. If you look at the Constitution, the Constitution explains how the Majority Leader and Minority Leader is elected in the National Assembly. It doesn't say anything about the Senate. Okay, more tweets, more tweets coming in thick and fast. Let's see them. Uh, Wafula. Bob, is that your relative? Namiti says, DP's wing of Jubilee dared the president for a fight for the last three years. Let them face the heat now. Let them come out of the kitchen. Your thoughts? You know, that's a fight between those guys. I don't know. I, <laughs> let's, let's see how it goes, you know. Uh, I, think, I, I think we'll have proper clarity in terms of, you know, Kenyan politics and the way it goes from next year. You know, when, from March 2021, that's the time we will really see the trajectory of Kenyan politics is taken. You know what, Grand Mullah, and this is just an observation. I've never seen you, heard you say anything negative about the deputy president. You're always, you know, kind of there on the edge, just urging him on. You've never said anything. You've never uh, criticized him. <laughs> but have you, have you seen me? I've never criticized the president because, I mean, both them, you know, both the deputy president and the president who are my client in the last presidential election. I have a lot of regard for them. I mean... Uh, I like them, you know, I know them, uh, I wish them well, both of them, I have no problem with them. Uh, of course, they are not saints, both of them, and I've said many times, they have weaknesses like all of us, and, uh, but I mean, uh, I haven't said bad things about Rayla, if you read my tweets, have, I haven't said bad things about Modavadi or <laughs> Calonzo, I don't say. You were critical of them before, though. <laughs> All right. There's, uh, I'm still critical. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Team Waligo says lightning doesn't strike twice on the same point. Is this the case? Jubilee is broken and can't be rebuilt? No, no. Uh, you know, sometimes I've said this many times. I don't know why people are fighting over Jubilee. I mean, if I was the deputy president or uh, even the president, I mean, Jubilee is a, it's a soiled brand, you know. Why do you want to have Jubilee? I mean, uh, although it's a party I've, you know, voted for in the last elections, like many voters, I mean, Jubilee hasn't delivered, you know. They haven't delivered on the economy. They have not delivered on the rule of law. They have not delivered on jobs. They have not delivered on so many things. Uh, I mean, Jubilee government is very corrupt. Everybody knows that. I mean, they have met corruption, you know. Nope, we have never seen corruption on this scale. So why, do, why, why does someone, for example, the deputy president, who wants to run election for 2022, why does he want to have Jubilee? <laughs> why, why don't you have a brand new vehicle? I mean, this is a, 
This is a second-hand car from Japan. <laughs> All right. Another viewer wants to know, what do you say of the perception that you, Grand Mula, are a system lawyer, a defender of the establishment in whatever shape it is, and you make a fortune in legal fees from clients like the IEBC and presidential candidates? You know, those are, those are idle talkers, you know, guys who don't know me. I mean, I acted for IEBC once in 2013. That was all. Mm. I've never acted for IEBC again. It was a one case off. I've never acted for IEBC. I don't act for, I don't act for the system. Uh, you know, my friend uh, Donald Kipkori makes this point that he acts for blue chip companies and he doesn't have working clients. He's my good friend, so I can make this comparison. Mm. I don't act for banks. Most of them, I think I act for maybe one or two. I don't act for state corporations. If you, I don't act for a state corporation, not a single one. I act for what I call the walk-in client. You know, the guy who walks in into my client with his food and say that, you know, there's a lawyer called Ahmed, I want to see him. Those are the kind of people I act for. I don't act for, I don't act for big corporations. I don't take pride that that uh, my, I act for blue chip companies. I take pride that I act for Wanjiku hmm. or Patel or Ahmed. <laughs> okay. Recently, you had on the cover of Nairobi Law Monthly, DPP, Nordin Haji, and DCI, Kinoti. Your thoughts about those two offices and officers? You know, I mean, it's an unfortunate thing. I mean, I think they were doing too well. They, I mean, both of them were, I mean, Knoti did a really great job in terms of, you know, when he took over the DCI, in terms of, you know, how Mohoro mismanaged it so badly. And uh, Nuruddin also, you know, did an amazing job. But I think we, th they must always work on the obvious. Nuruddin has the powers to prosecute. He makes the decision. The pack stops with him. If he says, I'm not prosecuting X, that is the end of it. Uh, Kinoti, actually, you know, the constitution does not even refer to the office of Kinoti. The, the constitution refers to the IG, the inspector general. Haji is supposed to deal with the inspector general, not with the DCI. Because when he is addressing, you know, the police, he's supposed to address the inspector general. So the inspector general is a policeman. He investigates, he, he, he compiles evidence. Then he gives to DCI. If DCI throws him on his face, I mean, he should pick it, dust it off, and go and do a better job. If the DPP says that this is a good case, I will prosecute. That's the end of the story. So you know this. I mean, you know when when you hear that there is a there is a tussle between the two, it is unheard of in a democracy, completely unheard of, because the DPP is a very powerful constitutional office when it comes to the justice sector. The Inspector General of the DCI works under the command of the DPP. But you know, Kenya is, you know, there's power grids, you know. There are some people who are connected to powerful power grids, and some people are not connected to powerful power grids. So that sometimes elevates your office higher than what is it in law. Hmm. Another viewer wants to know, why were Philip Murgo and Martha Karua excluded from the senior council? I was not in that uh, committee that decided. I mean, uh, I have a lot of regard for both of them. I mean, Martha is an amazing lady. Everybody knows. Whether it is in politics, whether uh, when she was minister for justice or water, as a lawyer. I mean, she's, she's an amazing person. And I think, no, she wasn't actually excluded. She was included. Both of them were included, but they were caught up in this. But I think, as I told you, once we, we settle into this new job and we do the you know, the, whole, uh, the housekeeping, those are issues we'll resolve. Okay, someone else wants to know, give us an example of one Wanjiko or Ahmed you've represented. Oh, it will take summer. I mean, I'll spend here the whole night if I give you that list. <laughs> okay, Laboso Claire wants to know, will Kenya be able to support a referendum and an election in two years? With the current economic crisis, you see, I mean, uh, you see, the people who are push, the people who are pushing the referendum, you know, they don't care about the economy of this country. They don't know about 
you know, they don't know, they, they don't care how much money they will spend. And you know, the relative, you know, value, I mean, they, they could have spent that 10 or 15 or 20 billion on something more important for the common man. But that doesn't matter for them. What matters for them is, I mean, this is a chess game. This is a game of politics. And they want to shape the politics of Kenya in the future. They don't give a damn about what Wenjiku will eat tomorrow. Okay, Emmanuel Koske says parties are very important institutions in promoting democracy. Instead of promoting them, we kill them here in Kenya. I think, uh, Jeff, there's a politician who said many years ago that parties in Kenya don't matter. He said they're like shots. I remove one today, I put another shot. I mean, parties are like that. So even when you see Jubilee in Broadin, I mean, don't, don't, shed, don't cry for Jubilee. Because tomorrow, there will be Jubilee 201. The next day, there will be Jubilee 301. So don't worry. I mean, parties are like shots. You remove a shot today, you put a shot tomorrow. I mean, there are 150 parties on the shelves, so you can buy any party. Uh, guess who's watching, Grand Mula? Atuoli himself. He has a, something to say. He says... Trade union is a pressure group and is supposed to act as an alternative to national guidance. And that's what KOTU does. Poor guy. He doesn't know what he's talking about, does he? Uh, I'm why Brian says you're making me sweat in this studio today, Graham Muller. This party had a chance to solve their differences privately and chose not to. He's wearing, obviously, to Jubilee. Instead, they chose for public display. And as usual, the public is treated to another political circus when we should be worrying about other issues, for example, COVID-19. You agree? You know, Jubilee, I mean, when you look at the, uh, you know, the, the implosion of Jubilee, if I say it, I mean, it's unfortunate because, you know, Jubilee has almost a... Uh, uh, they have a, if you look at the majority in the National Assembly, uh, they have an overwhelming majority. Uh, they have a good majority in the Senate. So it's a party that can push any agenda it wants, uh, that it has gone the way it, it is going. You know, it's difficult to understand because I think this, it has never happened in the history of Kenya for a president of a ruling party to sort of disengage from his party or divide his party and form a coalition with other parties when he doesn't need. I mean, what do you need Kanu for? For example, if I ask you, Jeff, what do you need Kanu for? Kanu is a one-man show. I mean, it's a one-man. I mean, it is a Nick Salat party. That's all, isn't it? <laughs> what about Gideon Moy? Uh, Gideon, I mean, Gideon is there, but I mean, I think Kanu belongs to Nick Salat, and everybody knows it's a one-person party. It's a Nick Salat's party, and uh, probably assisted by, by, by Fadel. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't they say Kanu ni Baba na Mama? <laughs> Interesting times. <laughs> okay, one more tweet. Mwema Alvin says the Jubilee Party members are playing the role of enemies in their own party. The big question is which side is losing, the ruling Jubilee Party or the opposition? I think whichever party, you know, whichever side really doesn't matter. What matters is that, you know, Jubilee is basically, there's a fissure, you know, there's, it has, it's dysfunctional. It's no longer a functional party, you know. It's not, it's, Jubilee is not the ruling party really because I don't think, you know, we can talk of Jubilee as a ruling party in any sense uh, from now on. But I think the important thing is, you know, to never lose sight of, you know, the future. I think Kenya will move on. Uh, we, let's see what happens uh, until the end of this year in terms of politics, in terms of the economy. I mean, we are doing very badly in terms of economy. The country is almost grinding to a halt. The country has no money. We are in debt. I mean, the good thing is, uh, I, think the, I think the good thing is that we can't borrow anymore. I think that's something that's good for Kenyans. We can't borrow anymore. I don't think anybody will lend us anymore. <laughs> so mm. that's a good thing. We just got 107 billion shillings today, Grand Mola, and another 87 last week. Those are emergencies. Those are emergencies. For, these are, you know, to mitigate this virus. But in terms of, you know, those grand projects like the railways where you get 4 billion 
and people take uh, 20, 30 percent kickbacks. That's over. Nobody will give you money. Kickbacks have died now. Hmm. Coming back to politics, Graham Mullah, as we wind up, if the deputy president was to leave this, his side of Jubilee, walk away, let's say, for instance, would he still get the support of, say, Mount Kenya region? It, it depends on when to walk away. I mean, I, I don't think it makes sense for him to walk away now because, I mean, there's no incentive to walk away because if you walk away now, you walk into oblivion, and I don't think he wants to do that. But uh, you see, I think if you look, if I, were, if I was an advisor to the deputy president, which I'm not, <laughs> and I have no problem uh, if, he tells, if he asks my advice in the future, <laughs> I, think, I think the difficult he has is just how to manage from now to December. That is the biggest problem he has. If he manages very well, I think he has bought already two, three months through this crisis of COVID. I don't know what the future holds for him. But if he can manage until December, then he's fine. Because from January next year, I mean, it's for everybody on his own and God for us all. Your friend Mohammed Weliye, all the way in the kingdom, has a message for you. He says, good to see the Grand Mullah admit that Jubilee has failed. Baba is here to rescue Jubilee, and that pains the Grand Mullah a lot. Tell him to meza wembe alafu alale. No, no. I mean, if you, you see, if you are an honest Kenyan, and there are many honest Kenyans, I think it is hypocritical to say that Baba is coming to save uh, Jubilee. And the history of Kenyans, of Kenyans, and the history of Baba is very clear. He never comes to save a party. When he joined Kanu, he didn't save Kanu. When he joined the coalition with Kibaki, it wasn't a mission to save. When he is coming to join Jubilee, it's not a mission to save. So let us not be delusional. Let us not be dis hypocritical or dishonest in our discourse. And I think, and I hope uh, Professor Macau is watching also this. Baba, when, or, when they join the ruling party, we know it is for temporal, selfish, personal interest. And I will repeat that again. It is never for the good of the country. It's never for the good of the majority. It is very selfish, and everybody must see that. And I'm sure, Jeff, you can see that. They said nobody could stop reggae, Grand Muller. <laughs> we'll see that. <laughs> Grand Muller. Well, we'll just have to uh, leave it at that for now. Listen, uh, thank you so much for your time. I know uh, fasting is over in a couple of uh, hours or starts in a couple of hours. And Monday is a public holiday, so I wish you Eid Mubarak in advance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff, and uh, thank you. And same for you and your family. Thank you so much, and all the best to you. Thanks for your candid, candid answers to our tough, tough questions. And thank you for being a part Thank you very much. of Jeff Koinange Live. Keep tweeting at Koinange Jeff at Citizen TV Kenya. The hashtag is JK Live. Let's do it again next week. Maybe a Twali will agree to show up and rebuttal some of the things that the Grand Mullah said. Good night. Good luck. Stay safe. Stay home. Stay strong. <laughs>